Um, you know, I was at the, the men's retreat, the Ganderbrook men's retreat, and one thing that, they, that really stuck out to me or something that I remembered is that they, said, they kept emphasizing how important it was that you read your Bible, read the Bible to your children, and to instruct them early on and to take an intentional effort in their early life so that they don't depart from it when they get older. Uh, and I think it's a blessing that we have so many young people here today. Uh, and, um, you know, we, we should be thankful that, uh, that these children here um, are able to sing praises to God, to hear His Word. Um, just, just thinking about that. But we're here this morning to talk about the revelation of the mystery, right? This is the revelation of the mystery that's revealed in the Gospel. You know, last week we talked about who Jesus was, right? In the Colossians, in the Colossian letter. And what that means to us. This morning I want to talk about the revelation of God's will and how that mystery is revealed in the coming of Jesus Christ. And if you've ever found yourself kind of feeling aimless or lost or wondering what is God's plan for you, the Bible is a revelation of that mystery of your life. It tells you the way that you need to go. And the focus of our lesson today will be around a passage, uh, Ephesians 1, 9 through 10. We're going we're gonna to talk about what, that, what the implications of that passage is as we, and go through a lot of Ephesians. Uh, and I want to read that now, just so you can have it in your mind, just to be thinking about it. It says, He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His kind intention, which He purposed in Him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens, and things on the earth. So what is this mystery that we're talking about? What is the mystery that's revealed in the Gospel? We're going to be looking at that. But before we do, before we do, I want to go back in time, way back in time, to what caused this mystery in the first place? Why was there a need to have a mystery revealed? And we go all the way back to the time of Genesis, and we see that God made everything good. He made everything perfect. He made this perfect garden of Eden, and He put Adam and Eve in there. He created man, and He, he made him in his own image, and he made him to tend in that garden. So yes, um, Adam even worked back then. He just didn't like sit there underneath the trees and have the fruit fall into his face. He was supposed to work even back then, although it didn't have to deal with weeds. But God made mankind special in all of creation. He made us with the ability to do something that nothing else could do. And that is to choose. Men and women are given free will. Free to choose the perfection and everlasting righteousness of God or to give in to a desire to try to seize the qualities and the characters of God and the power of God for ourselves. To control it ourselves. And as we all know, all of us who have read the, the book of Genesis know that Adam and Eve ate the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil because they wanted to have wisdom and power like God. It led to a, the original sin and the curse of that sin. And the curse brought forth the sting of death, right? Death and corruption. And it meant that the world would never be the same. That it would always suffer in its futility. And that's why King Solomon said all things are vanity because all things die. All things perish. All things decay. There's nothing that lasts forever. Everything breaks down. And it suffers from the calamity and the darkness of sin. And since that time, there has been this mystery. It's a mystery of exactly what is God's plan for this broken world for us who are broken. And there's a lot of people today that don't know the answer to that, even though it's been answered for 2,000 years. 
there are even Christians that don't know the answer to this mystery. They don't know the answers that the Bible gives us. There are so many people that struggle with doubt and have unanswered questions and don't understand why things are the way that they are. All this stuff that leads to death, what sense is there in that? Why, does, why do people have to die? Why is everything dark and depressing and lonely and lost? You know, that is a common thing that I hear in the world about why people don't believe in God. I, I heard, I don't know if you've heard of him, but Neil deGrasse Tyson, Tyson or deGrasse Tyson, uh, he's a, a scientist, like I think an astrophysicist or something like that. I and mean, he's on every PBS special that was ever made and also on half of the Discover Channel ones. And he says he doesn't belo- believe in God because God allows suffering. How can a good creator of God allow people to suffer in this world? The reason why so many people ask this question is because they just don't know the the answers are out there. They don't understand what the message of the Gospel truly is and what it's about. That it does seek to answer that exact question. The Bible tells us that the world is unfair. The Bible tells us that the world is broken. The Bible tells us that everything carries the weight of a curse. And that curse is sin, and it gives birth to the corruption that ultimately leads to death. This was a path that was not chosen by God, right? We remember, God made everything good and perfect in the world. But this was a path that was chosen by men, by people. The Bible tells us that thing, the things are the way they are because people chose the imperfection of their own selfish desires. They gave in to their dark urges. They rejected the perfection and the goodness of God. So all of us, now we look at this broken and disordered world, we look at the unfair and callous nature of the world, and we question, well, is there a God? But it's precisely because we try to be God that the world is unfair and broken like it is. God gave us a good and perfect gift, but He also gave us the ability to destroy that gift. It's much like whenever you pass down a treasured family heirloom. Does anybody have a treasured family, family heirloom in their, in their house somewhere? Rebecca's got a cuckoo clock that came from her, um, her aunt but it's a precious heirloom to her, and she puts it in a place of prominence. Now, if we were to give that cuckoo clock to one of our sons and he was to go outside and smash it against a rock, that is what people did with God's precious and perfect gift. You know, it's like God gave humanity one of these really fancy $28 million Rolls-Royce boat tails. Yeah, it's a boat tail. Can you, you going to call a car a boat tail? I mean, Seriously? but $28 million for that car. And then we just get behind that wheel and we immediately drive it into a ditch and set it on fire. Today, people say there's no God because they're looking at this Rolls Royce that's been caught on fire and is buried in a ditch. They ask, why doesn't God just come and fix the car? Just like, fix it, Daddy. Come and pull me out and put another $28 million into this thing and fix this car. The reason is that the car has been totaled and it's not worth $28 million and it isn't worth five cents. And if he did fix it, you know what we would do? We would smash it again. We would, wouldn't we? We know that's true because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all sin. And so if he fixed everything up, made it perfect, made everything right again with this world, that we would just smash it right into a ditch and set it on fire all over again. We have to be honest with ourselves. That's what we do. But did God intend for the world to just go on suffering and dealing with the consequences of Adam and Eve's sin? Or was there something in the Gospel or something that God planned to, to change that? 
to change this inevitability? Does God have an answer for our corruption? Does he have an answer for our arrogance and our pride from sin, our hatred and our malice, our desire to create war and fight against peace? Does God have a plan to put back the pieces that we tore asunder like wild pigs, you know? Yes. Yes, he does. But sometimes it's not in the way that we might think that it should be. And that is the mystery of the revelation of God and, the God and what the Gospel is all about. It's God's plan for humanity. It's God's plan for me and you. But like with Adam and Eve before you, you have a choice. You still have a choice that whether you will accept God's new and improved and better free gift or whether you will reject it. The message of the Gospel is about change, really. It's, a, it's, it's about making things new. It's about not trying to repair this broken world, but starting fresh. Having a new slate. And the world, the burnt out Rolls Royce that's been smashed into a dish, is going to go away. Right? It says in 2 Peter 3.10, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Right? The world is not supposed to last forever. It's destined for annihilation. We broke it and it's done, right? It's not part of the plan of redemption. But you know what's special is that even though the world is not part of the plan of redemption, you are. You are, in God's eyes, worthy to be redeemed and to be saved from destruction. And that's an awesome thing. That's what the Gospel tells us, right? The world, the flesh, everything in it is broken, and God doesn't have a plan to fix it. He's going to burn it up. And that's something my wife says all the time. It's all going to burn up anyway, anytime I want to keep something. She tells me, we don't really need that. It's all going to burn up anyway. (laughs) Um, And that brings me to a point about this revelation. Another point, second point. How God planned in advance to restore us and save us from our own inevitable destruction. If we come over to uh, Ephesians 1, 4 through 5, see we're traveling around Ephesians here. We'll see that it has always been God's plan to fix this, to change this, that we, he knew we were going to wreck it, you know, he knew we were going to break our toys, and he had some, you know, this is something I, I <laughs> do sometimes, it's, it's wrong, I shouldn't do it, but sometimes I'll buy an extra if a toy if something's on sale, and I know my kids like it, because I know they're going to break it, you know, and uh, I'll, I'll pull it out, you know, I'll be like, hey, look, you know. Now, if they broke it on purpose, I might not do that, but (laughs) anyway, it was always God's plan to redeem us and adopt us as children through Jesus Christ, right? It says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. So in spite of our failure, in spite of how we fall short of the glory of God and that all of us make mistakes, we fall short, God has a plan to redeem us, doesn't he? He has a plan to to show us mercy. And he's had this plan all along because our God is a good God. Our God is a caring and loving God. And just like the parable of the prodigal son, God wants for us to come home to Him, right? God has a plan to restore a person who repents back to the household where we originally belong, doesn't He? God did not have to do this. He certainly doesn't owe us anything. He gave us a choice. The Scriptures say that God did this because He's kind and He's merciful and because He loves us. God does not want us to fail. But weak as we are, we have to realize that we actually need Him. 
right? We can delude ourselves to the point where we, don't, where we think we do not need God. And the vast majority of people in the world, they are under this delusion. They think that, well, I do not need God because they have not been brought low, right? The prodigal son had to see what life was like. He had to starve. He had to envy what pigs were eating in order to come back to the Father. And he came back humble and changed, and he repented. He knew that his Father was right. And that is what God wants for us too. You know, he lets us go off on our own way. He lets us spend everything, waste everything, destroy things, and then realize that we were doing it wrong all along. Because sometimes you have to make the mistakes yourself in order to realize what you had. The world does serve a purpose for us now, doesn't it? This world that we're all living in, in a very clear way, it shows us our weakness. It shows is a reflection of our inadequacy and our inability. Every time someone dies, it is a reminder of how helpless that we are to withstand death. We cannot fight against it. Tomorrow might be our last day. Adam and Eve could not comprehend how weak and unable they were until they had to face that curse. They had to contend with mortality and inability. And we have that same reality through our suffering. The world makes it clear of one thing in particular, that we are in need of a Savior. The brokenness of this world, the unfairness, our inability to control things, our inability to do things makes it clear that we are in need of God. We need Him to save us. And that makes sense, right? Everybody who's had kids, that sometimes they don't listen and they have to go and make the mistake and get hurt themselves, don't they? They go, they go around your back, they sneak around, and then they realize what you were telling them was some good advice. How many of you, like, you know, your parents told you don't go and do X, Y, and Z, and then you're like, Phew. you know? Does that ever happen to you? You ever take, tell your parents, like, whatever, mom and dad, you guys are so lame. Particularly when we're teenagers, right? Right? And then you, you, you do some, some, some foolish things, and then you realize how right your parents were when they were telling you to be careful, and you weren't careful. Right? Well, the same thing happens with our relationship between us and God. We get out into the world, and we realize that we can't handle this on our own. We, there's no way we can live forever. There's no magic formula, no amount of alchemy or anything, magical arts or whatever it is that people think they can do, or uh, science, all the things. Nobody can stop the inevitability of death, decay, and destruction. They're always like, hey, we, we made this you know, goat live for an extra two years, and we rejuvenated its cells, and then the goat still dies. There's no beating death. There's no beating death. So the next mystery that's revealed uh, in the Gospel and through Ephesians is that how God made our redemption possible. He made it possible through a perfect sacrifice. It says in Ephesians 1.7, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to to the, the riches of His grace. Jesus was the perfect sacrificial gift, wasn't He? Jesus gave His own life. He gave His own life's blood. And that is what it takes away our sin. This is not something any of us will ever be able to do on our own, is it? We need a perfect Savior. And no one is perfect. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Christians all know that we can't do it on our own. We need Jesus. We have sin. We're corrupted and broken. We can't atone because our purity is compromised. It's like being a cup of sewer water. It can never be good to drink until it's been changed. Right? 
they, they can do some amazing things now, right? Waste treatment plants, they, they dump into like reservoirs that people drink the water. But that water is not the same coming out of that place as it went into it, is it? That water has been transformed into something else. It's been changed. But we're all stuck at the former state. We're, we're the water that's going into the treatment plant, not the water that's coming out. Jesus makes us the water that's coming out. It had to be Jesus. Only God could be the perfect sacrifice for sin. The third revelation of this mystery is that our redemption, it goes beyond just being rescued by God and saved from our sins, but it, on top of that is an inheritance for us. Not an inheritance that we deserve, but an inheritance that was given to us out of the mercy of God and by His love, by His generous love. Remember the father with the prodigal son, he, he went and slayed the the, the fatted calf for him, right? He, he made it super special. Well, God thinks about no differently about you. You are special to Him. And He has an inheritance prepared beforehand for you. It says in Ephesians 1, 11 through 14 also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to His purpose, who works all things after the counsel of His will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be the praise of His glory. In Him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, the revelation of the mystery, having, been, having also believed, you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of His glory. We are all chosen by God to be redeemed, and that redemption comes through Jesus, the Son of God, and then we're given the Holy Spirit as a guarantee on top of those things to receive an inheritance according to His kindness and His mercy. If you move on to Ephesians 2, 6, and 7, it says, And He raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come, He might show the surpassing riches of His grace. Not just regular old grace, but the surpassing riches of His grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. A seat at the banquet table, the surpassing and overflowing riches of His grace, the power and the love of God brimming in our cup. It is beyond what we can imagine. You know, heaven will be a wonderful and perfect experience. It will be beyond amazing. It'll be awesome. But we're not going to do nothing when we get there, right? Some people are like, it's going to be like a beach day every day, right? We're just going to sit on the beach and it's going to be perfect and nothing, you know, the, the water will always be the perfect temperature. <laughs> God is not motivated, uh, unmotivated and lazy. And we should not think that we're going to be unmotivated and lazy in heaven. Uh, that we're, those who believe in Him will move to the place of eternal idleness. The revelation of God's mystery tells us that God created us for more than that. That He created us to do good work. Remember when He made Adam in the Garden of Eden and everything was good and perfect, Adam still was supposed to tend the garden and work in the garden. Not by the sweat of his brow and breaking his back and all that kind of stuff. But he was still supposed to do things. Be constructive, right? He tended the garden before the fall. It says in Ephesians 2.10, For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works and if on earth and in heaven, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. We're created for good works. We're still made in the image of God. And when we receive an incorruptible body and the mercies of God's grace, you don't think we're just going to do nothing with that, do you? I mean, you get a little tiny glimpse of what you might be doing. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6.3, do you not know that we will judge angels? That's work. How much more matters of this life? That means you should be able to judge right and wrong, but... You're going to judge angels. That's work. 
There are so many things that are revealed in the Gospel, so many mysteries that have been opened to us about God's plan. Gospels, they explain so many things. And I was only able to really touch the surface this morning. But it goes much deeper and it's much more profound. And the more that you study the Scriptures and you understand and how they apply to your life, the more is revealed to you and revealed to you personally. The message of the Gospel that I wanted to tell you this morning is that God doesn't forget us. right? And Adam and Eve, they messed up, but God always had a plan for them, didn't He? We didn't find out about it for thousands of years. But God didn't forget. God always was keeping things in motion. He was orchestrating things according to His will and His plans. And He was going to see that those things were, were done. And God's answer is not to put things back the way that they were so that we could just go and break them again, but instead to give us something greater, something better, something more wonderful and beautiful beyond our wildest imagination or comprehension. God has predestined to save those who come to Him out of their own free will. It is not for everyone. It is only for those who repent and who believe. Those people have to choose Him. We have to choose God to be with Him. He's not going to force us to be with Him. And we also discussed that God sent His Son to give His life as an atonement, a perfect sacrifice for our sins. And that God not only desires to, to give us redemption, for our sins, but He wants to pour out on us His mercies and His grace to our cup overflowing, a place at His table. We have an inheritance, an inheritance He's given us, and that that inheritance is guaranteed by the gift of the Holy Spirit of God. So God in His plan has also not designed us to be lazy and to do nothing but to be a good example when we're on this world when in this world and on this earth and even when we go to heaven to do work for him he's going to give us an, a perfect and incorruptible body and we're going to want to put that thing to use we're never going to get tired in heaven we'll always be able to do greater and better things and so we should live like we're in that right now shouldn't we we should live according to the manner worthy of which we've been called, right? How, shouldn't we do that? And isn't that in Ephesians also? It says in Ephesians 4, 1-3, through he says, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. And then he says to be humble with all humility and be gentle in gentleness with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. Just look at that sentence for just a minute and think about how you talk to people and how you deal with people every day. And you think, am I being humble right now? Am I showing gentleness right now? Am I being patient and being tolerant with people? And am I loving them? And then he says, be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We are all in this together. We're all here to support one another. And that takes vigilance and determination and diligence to make that happen. It does not happen on its own. It happens with effort. And that's what all these things are. Humility, gentleness, patience, tolerance, love. All those things require effort. And that is starting to live in the way that God called us to live. He's saying you've been given a great and perfect gift and you've repented and you've changed. Start living in that repentance. Start living in that change. Start believing in it and doing it with your life. So live this week knowing that the mystery has been revealed. And I want you to go out and make the world a better place by showing what kind of people that God's people can be. And live with humility and gentleness and patience. Live loving each other and being 
peaceful with one another. That's what God calls from all of us. And that's a pattern that we can show the world. And that's something that people desire. You know, people don't need what they know what they need until they see it, right? And they need this. People need this. And they'll know it when they see it. And they'll know it when they see it in you. At this time, I want to offer an invitation. If you want to come forward for whatever reason, if you want to give your life to Christ today, if you believe in Him, with your heart and your mind and your soul, you believe in Him, you want to trust in Him with your life today, and you want to change yourself and repent of your sins, accept that God is right in your life, and you're willing to be baptized in commitment to Him, then as the Scriptures tell us, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the down payment of the inheritance of His mercies and grace, the overflowing riches of His kindness. You receive the Holy Spirit, forgiveness of sins, and eternal life. If that's something that you want to do this morning, I want to encourage you to come forward as we sing our hymn, which is 701.